understand we're going to get into this uh, curious guy called Plato. Right? Plato? Plato? Yeah. Um, <coughs> Very interesting. Uh, this section has been called Plato's Failure, and it's probably well known to all of you, so I would either skip it or go over it. What's your opinion? Might as well go over it. All right, okay. Okay. We're at the point where two positions are being put forward, one Sibius and one Simeus, their arguments against the idea of reincarnation. Right? This is what it is. <clears throat> now remember now, they have arguments against something, they must at least hold to the notion of what it is. So therefore it presupposes in the dialogue that there's such a thing as a soul and body and there's death one. and the idea of reincarnation presupposes does it not that there's a cycle. Uh, you're born, you live your life, you die, enter the realm of the dead, are reborn, and so it goes on and on. And the two arguments against it are pretty interesting, and especially the one we're into, which is what if the soul is like the weaver who weaves many garments for himself, right? Um, let's call it many cloaks for himself. And so wears out. Uh, wears out the garment or the cloak and weaves another. And another. But finally dies in the cloak, the last cloak. Therefore, He's saying there can be many reincarnations, but that's not enough, because how do you not know that the soul is of such a kind, similar to the analogy that he's given, and therefore the soul is going to wear out, and therefore you don't know whether the particular soul you're wearing now may be the last one, and therefore it will end it all. Agree? This is where we are. Okay, um, let's get into the way... Just could you could you tilt that angle of that hat out? Because um, it can't be read very well by the camera. Thank you, thank you. Can everybody still up oh, too far? I, I think for these people here, everyone still. Reading? This one too. Fine. No, it's perfect. Thank you. That was fine. Think something of it. Okay. Um, essentially, we're at about eighty-eight. 90 is really just to look it over. And it has a shock to those present. And now Socrates has to now deal with it. Get into there's an interesting part about uh, 
Socrates' view of his own philosophy, which I thought would be worthwhile picking up first, which is at uh, 90 C, uh, D, excuse me, which in our lobe is page 313, if you have a lobe, if not. Any of you have an extra copy? A little bit of rouse. Could you share a copy? No, thank you. Anyone else need a copy? Copy, copy, copy. Okay, he's now dealing with arguments. Thanks. Yeah, find the page for that. First, then, let us be on our guard against this. And let us not admit into our souls the notion that there is no soundness in arguments at all. Let us rather assume that we ourselves are not yet sound in sound condition, and that we must strive manfully and eagerly to become so. <clears throat> and the others for the sake of all your future life. And I, because my impending death, for I fear that I am not just now in a philosophical frame of mind as regards this particular question, but am quite contentious, quite like uncultured persons. For when they argue about anything, they do not care what the truth is in the matters that they are discussing but are eager only to make their own views seem true to their hearers. And I fancy I differ from them just now only to this extent. I shall not be eager to make what I say seem true to my hearers, except as a secondary matter, but shall be very eager to make myself believe it. For see, my friend, how selfish my attitude is. If what I say is true, I'm the gainer by believing it. And if there be nothing for me after death, at any rate, I shall not be burdened to my friends by my lamentations in these last moments. And this ignorance of mine will not last, for that would be an evil, but soon end. So, Simeon and Sibi, as I approach the argument with my mind, thus prepared. But you, if you do it, right, if you do as I ask, will give little thought to Socrates, and much more to truth, to the truth, and to think that what I say is true, regard to it, and if not, oppose me with every argument you can muster, that I may not, in my eagerness, deceive myself and you alike, and go away like a bee leaving my sting sticking in you. All right, okay, then he's gonna recollect. And um, here's another way of looking at it. Now we're on page 321, which is 93A, on the top of the right hand side of the sheet. You can see that we've got a load. I mean, a grouse. Now, <clears throat> I like this for uh, several reasons. Uh, and, uh, but be, I think maybe uh, we won't be able fully to see Plato's failure yet. It, it takes more pages, I think, than we might do tonight. And I'm too bad about <laughs> that. But let's get a couple of people to dialogue it and we'll play. Play? Someone else? Mm -hmm. I'll do it. Which one? Either one. Mm. Here's another way of looking at it, Simeon. You'll be Simeon, sir? I'll be Socrates. Regina, Socrates? Sure. We have it. <laughs> Here's okay. another way of looking at it, Simeon, said he. Where Do you think a harmony oh, or any other composite thing can be in any other state than that in which the, the elements are of which it is composed? Right, have you got it? Yeah. Certainly not. 
Uh, well, that's a good quote. Want to do it again? Certainly not. See that? <laughs> <laughs> you can quote that from now on. <laughs> and it can neither do nor suffer any other than they do. And it can neither do nor suffer anything other than they do or suffer. Yeah. Then a harmony cannot be expected to lead the elements of which it is composed, but to follow. Yes. A harmony then is quite unable to move or make a sound or do anything else that is opposed to its component parts. Quite unable. Well then, is not every harmony by nature a harmony according as it is harmonized? I don't understand. Would it not be more completely a harmony and a greater harmony if it were harmonized more fully and to a greater extent? Assuming that to be possible and less completely, and assuming that to be possible and less completely a harmony and a lesser harmony, if less completely harmonized and to a less extent. Certainly. Is this true of the soul? Is one soul even the slightest degree more completely and to a greater extent a soul than another, or less completely and to a less extent? Not in the least. Well now, one soul is said to possess sense and virtue and to be good, and another to possess folly and wickedness and to be bad. Is this true? Yes, it is true. Hold it. Okay. Hey, all he's going to do is take the implications of this and push it back on the argument. The argument is the liar is like the body, the soul is like the soul, harmony is like the soul, the body is like the liar. He says, all right, if you assume this is true, there are various different kinds of harmony, some are greater and some are lesser. Right. Now he's going to say, all right, if that's true, then let's apply it to the soul. What's he doing? He's taking the analogy seriously, he's expanding it, and saying if this is true, if the soul is like the harmony, and harmony have these features about it, then the same feature should be about the soul if this is a sound argument. Hmm. Well, he's holding on to the analogy, isn't he? Okay, watch what he does. Go ahead. <clears throat> now, what will those who assume that the soul is a harmony say that these things, the virtue and the wickedness in the soul are? Will they say that this is another kind of harmony and a discord, and that the soul, which is itself a harmony, has within it another harmony, and that the other soul is a discordant and has no other harmony within it? I cannot tell, but evidently those who make that assumption would say something of that sort. But we agree that one soul is no more or less a soul than another, and that is equivalent to an agreement that one is no more and to no greater extent and no less and to no less extent a harmony than another, is it not? Certainly. And that which is no more or, no, or less a harmony is no more or less harmonized. Is that not so? Yes. But has that which is no more and no less harmonized any greater or any less amount of harmony? Or an equal amount? An equal amount. Then a soul, since it is neither more nor less a soul than another, is neither more nor less harmonized. That is so. And therefore can and therefore can have no greater amount of discord or of harmony. No. And therefore again one soul can have no greater amount of wickedness or virtue than another. If wickedness is discord and virtue harmony. It cannot. Or rather, to speak exactly, Simeus, no soul will have any wickedness at all if the soul is a harmony. For if a harmony is entirely harmony, it could have no part in discord. Therefore, not. Right. the consequences that follow that everyone will accept about the nature of the soul cannot be explained in terms of theology. It's over. It's actually over earlier, isn't it, when he agreed that the soul is not a harmony. Now he's pushing the implications of it. Now it goes back to the soul. Talk about the soul when you agree there's some, there's some wicked soul. So would you say there's a wicked harmony or discord? Now it's going back. 
Okay, let's build. Go ahead. Then the soul, being entirely soul, could have no part in wickedness. Well, how could it if what we have said is right? According to this argument, then, if all souls are by nature equally souls, all souls of all living creatures will be equally good. So it seems, Socrates. And do you think that this is true, and that our reasoning would have come to this end, if the theory that the soul is a harmony were correct? Not in the least. Well, of all the parts that make up a man, do you think any is ruler except the soul? Especially if it be a wise one. No, I do not. If the idea that the soul presupposes there's a ruler or something in charge, therefore he's going to take that and go back to the idea of harmony and see whether it could be used to explain it. If it doesn't, it fails. Okay, let's go. Well, he says, and do you think that this is true and that our reasoning would have come to this end if the theory that the soul is harmony, oh, I see, were correct? He's got two questions. Yeah. <laughs> do it again, Jim. And do you think that this is true? What? And that our I got it. I'm and sorry. that our reasoning would have come to this. Three. If the theory that the soul is a harmony were correct. Not at least. Jim, could you read that paragraph again, please? And do you think that this is true and that our reasoning would have come to this end? If the theory that the soul is a harmony were correct. Therefore, conclusion? Well, I guess I miss it. Yeah, I, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why I should read it again. That's all. Okay. Okay. Well. Semios? Not in the least. Therefore? Okay. It's over. Yeah. What, but, go ahead. Well. He's not going to give up. No. Well, of all the parts that make up a man, do you think any is ruler except the soul? Especially if it be a wise one. No, I do not. See, now he's going to spell out everything he knows about the soul. One, two, three, four, five. And he's going to go back and see whether or not the theory which he agreed is inadequate, whether it's adequate enough to deal with those points that he knows about the nature of the soul. He's taking a bigger hole, isn't it? Right? So he's not, he's, he's, not, he's not interested in a logical conclusion, getting out of the argument by getting some quick solution. He said, come on, there's more, there's more, there's more to this. Yeah. Same thing in the Theotetus and later. Go ahead. Let's well, watch it. Okay. Well, of all the parts that make up a man, do you think any is ruler except the soul, especially if it be a wise one? No, I do not. Does it yield to the feelings of the body or oppose them? I mean, when the body is hot and thirsty, does not the soul oppose it and draw it away from drinking and from eating when it is hungry? And do we not see the soul opposing the body in countless other ways? Certainly. Now he applies it to the analogy. Go ahead. Did we not agree in previous discussion that it could never, if it be a harmony, give forth a sound or variance with the tensions and relaxations and vibrations and other conditions of the elements which compose it, but that it would follow them and never leave them. There goes the idea that it can be likened to the ruler, the ruling function of the soul. It follows, doesn't leave. Right? So watch where you go. Right? Yes, we did, of course. What is the ruling? I'm missing something here. What is the ruling part? Harmony? Is that, I'm missing something. Was, yeah, yeah. I just thought I understood it and then it disappeared. Yeah, I, uh, maybe because of one key word that's pretty important, uh, wives. Well, Socrates, well said Socrates, of all the parts that make up a man, do you think any is ruler except the soul, especially if it is a wise one? Right? It's not just taking any soul. If there are wise souls, we do not agree that wise soul is being ruled, is a ruler. Right. That's what he's doing. Now he's going to see whether that idea can be absorbed or agreed with the notion of harmony. That's all. Okay. Right. Does harmony lead or does harmony follow? The elements that compose of it. Okay. 
Can I read that section then again? Sure, sure, sure. Does it, yield, uh, does it yield to the feelings of the body or oppose them? I mean, when the body is hot and thirsty, does not the soul oppose it and draw it away from drinking and from eating when it is hungry? And do we not see the soul opposing the body in countless other ways? Yes. That's an example of ruling. Right. Right? So okay. he makes that clear, does he not? Mm -hmm. Now he's going to see whether that idea is compatible with the idea of the harmony. soul being a harmony. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Did we not agree in our previous discussion that it could never, if it be a harmony, give forth a sound or variance with the tensions and relaxations and vibrations and other conditions of the elements which compose it? but that it would follow them and never lead them, so it can't be ruler. Right, oh. Thanks. Go ahead. Yes, we did, of course. Well then, do we not now find that the soul acts in exactly the opposite way, leading those elements of which it is said to consist, and opposing them in almost everything through all our life, and tyrannizing over them in every way? sometimes inflicting harsh and painful punishments, those of the gymnastics and medicine, and sometimes milder ones, and sometimes threatening and sometimes admonishing. In short, speaking to the desires and passions and fears as if it were distinct from them and they from it, as Homer has shown in the Odyssey when he says of Odessa, he smote his breast and thus he chided his heart, endured his heart, did us bear worse than this? Do you suppose that when he wrote those words, he thought of the soul as a harmony, which would be led by the conditions of the body, and not rather as something fitted to lead and rule them, and itself a far more divine thing than a harmony? By Zeus Artes, the latter, I think. Then, my good friend, it will never do for us to say that the soul is a harmony, for we should, it seems, agree neither with Homer the divine poet, nor with ourselves. That is true. Very well. Harmonia, the Thebian goddess, has, it seems, been moderately gracious to us. But how, Sibius, and by what argument can we find gracious, find grace in the sight of Cadmus? I think you will find a way. At any rate, you conducted this okay. way. Now that's the second argument. Now we're going into this one. Right. Remember that what we said before about Cadmus and Harmonia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I think we can get into the fun, having a little fun. Okay. <laughs> okay. So look here. Here's the argument. What if the soul is the weaver weaving many art many garments? And therefore each of the cloaks is like a wearing out each time the soul finally the soul is a totally exhausted and no longer has any further life to it and therefore it finally dies and cannot be reborn. Now look what Sock says to it. Right. Let me read a couple of just sections so we can be together. Um, I'm at 95C. This paragraph starts, My friend, do not be boastful. Least some evil eye put you out the argument that is to come. That, however, is in the hands of God. Let us in Homeric fashion charge the foe and test the worth of what we say. Now, the sum total of what you seek is this. You demand a proof that our soul is indestructible, immortal, if the philosopher who is confident in the face of death and thinks that after death he will fare better in the other world than he had lived this life differently, is it not to, to find his confidence senseless and foolish if this argument is said to be true? Right. Now it makes no difference, you say whether a soul enters into a body once or many times, so far as the fear each of us feels is concerned for anyone, unless he's a fool, must fear if he does not know and cannot prove that the soul is immortal, that it may die in the last garment in the last life of the soul. Right? That, Cebes, I think, is what you mean. Right? So Socrates pauses. 
right? He's absorbed in thought. And now he's going to go into a very interesting, whole beautiful issue. And by the way, there's an interesting book called The Mind, the Mind of Nature by a guy by the name of Martin. And uh, it's right here. So it's an interesting part. We'll come to it. All right. Um, let, let me therefore move to uh, Socrates' exploration. Socrates paused for some time, was absorbed in thought. Then he said, you know, it's no small thing that you seek, for the cause of generation and decay must be completely investigated. Now I will tell you my own experience in the matter, if you wish. Then if, then, if anything I say seems to you be of, of any use, you can employ it for the solution of your own difficulty. Certainly, I wish to hear. Listen then, I'll tell you. All right? And here's where we need a leader, because you know I don't like to work. You're good? Yeah. Thank you. When Listen I, then, and I will tell you. Go ahead. When I was young, CBs, I was tremendously eager for the kind of wisdom which they call investigation of nature. I thought it was a glorious thing to know the causes of everything why each thing comes into being, and why it perishes, and why it exists. And I was always unsettling myself with such questions as these. Do heat and cold by a sort of, for <coughs> excuse me, do heat and cold by a sort of fermentation bring about the organization of animals, as some people say? Is it the blood, or air, or fire by which we think? Or is it none of these? And does the brain furnish the sensations of hearing and sight and smell? And do memory and opinion arise from these? And does knowledge come from memory and opinion in a state of rest? And again, I tried to find out how these things perish. And I investigated the phenomena of heaven and earth until finally I made up my mind that I was by nature totally unfitted for this kind of investigation. And I will give you a sufficient proof of this. I was so completely blinded by these studies that I lost the knowledge that I, and others also, thought I had before. I forgot what I had formerly believed. I knew about many things, and even about the cause of man's growth. For I had thought previously that it was plain to everyone that man grows through eating and drinking. For when, from the food he eats, flesh is added to his flesh and bones to his bones, and in the same way the appropriate thing is added to each of his other parts, then the small bulk becomes greater and the small man large. That is what I used to think. Doesn't that seem to you reasonable? Yes. Now listen to this too. I thought I was sure enough when I saw a tall man standing by a short one, that he was, say, taller by a head than the other, and that one horse was larger by a head than another horse. And, to mention still clearer things than those, I thought ten were more than eight because two had been added to the eight. And I thought a two-cubit rule was longer than a one-cubit rule because it exceeded it by half its length. And now what do you think of them? By Zeus, I am far from thinking that I know the cause of any of these things. I, who do not even dare to say when one is added to one, whether the one to which the addition was made has become two, or the one which was added, or the one which was added and the one to which it was added became two by the addition of each to the other. I think it is wonderful that when each of them was separate from the other, each was one, and they were not then two. And when they were brought near each other, this juxtaposition was the cause of their becoming two. <laughs> and I cannot yet believe that if one is divided, the division causes it to become two. For this is the opposite of the cause which produced two in the former case. For then two arose because one was brought near and added to another one, and now because one is removed and separated from another. And I no longer believe that I know by this method even how one is generated, or in a word how anything is generated or is destroyed or exists. And I no longer admit this method, but have another confused way of my own. Then one day, 
What's the idea of causes? He's just giving them up. He's got his own way of proceeding. Let's find it. Then one day I heard a man reading from a book, and he was, as he said, by Anaxagoras, <clears throat> that it is the mind that arranges and causes all things. I was pleased with this theory of cause, and it seemed to me to be somehow right that the mind should be the cause of all things. And I thought, if this is so, the mind, in arranging things, arranges everything and establishes each thing as it is best for it to be. So if anyone wishes to find the cause of the generation or destruction or existence of a particular thing, he must find out what sort of existence or passive state of any kind or activity is best for it. And therefore, in respect to that particular thing and other things too, a man need examine nothing but what is best and most excellent. For then he will necessarily know also what is inferior, since the science of both is the same. As I considered these things, I was delighted to think that I had found in Anaxagoras a teacher of the cause of things quite to my mind. And I thought he would tell me whether the earth is flat or round. And when he had told me that, would go on to explain the cause and the necessity of it, and would tell me the nature of the best, and why it is best for the earth to be as it is. And if he said the earth was in the center, he would proceed to show that it is best for it to be in the center. And I had made up my mind that if he made those things clear to me, I would no longer yearn for any other kind of cause. And I had determined that I would find out in the same way about the sun and the moon, and the other stars, their relative speed, their revolutions, and their other changes, and why the active or passive condition of each of them is for the best. For I never imagined that when he said they were ordered by intelligence, he would introduce any other cause for these things than, it is, than that it is best for them to be as they are. So I thought when he assigned the cause of each thing and of all things in common, he would go on and explain what is best for each and what is good for all in common. I prized my hopes very highly, and I seized the books very eagerly and read them as fast as I could, that I might know as fast as I could about the best and the worst. Gosh, Socrates, you must have spent a great deal of money collecting all those books and studying each night to grasp the very secret of Anaxagoras. What did you find? My glorious hope, my friend, was quickly snatched away from me. As I went on with the, my reading, I saw that the man made no use of intelligence and did not assign any real causes for the ordering of things, but mentioned as causes air and ether and water and many other absurdities. And it seemed to me it was very much as if one should say that Socrates does with intelligence whatever he does, and then, in trying to get the causes of the particular thing I do, should say first that I am now sitting here because my body is composed of bones and sinews, and the bones are hard and have joints which divide them, and the sinews can be contracted and relaxed, and with the flesh and the skin which contains them all are laid about the bones. And so, as the bones are hung loose in their ligaments, the sinews, by relaxing and contracting, make me able to bend my limbs now, and that it is that that is the cause of my sitting here with my legs bent. Or, as if in the same way he should give voice and air and hearing and countless other things of the sort as causes for our talking with each other, and should fail to mention the real causes, which are that the Athenians decided that it was best to condemn me, and therefore I have decided that it was best for me to sit here, and that it is right for me to stay and undergo whatever penalty they order. For by the dog I fancied these bones and sinews of mine would have been in Megara or Boeotia long ago, carried thither by an opinion of what was best. If I did not think it was better and nobler to endure any penalty the city may inflict rather than to escape and run away. But it is most absurd to call things of that sort causes. If anyone were to say that I could not have done what I thought proper, if I had not bones and sinews and other things that I have, he would be right. But to say that those things are the cause of my doing what I do, and that I act with intelligence, but not from the choice of what is best, would be an extremely careless way of talking. Whoever talks in that way is unable to make a distinction and to see that in reality a cause is one thing, 
And the thing without which the cause could never be a cause is quite another thing. And so it seems to me that most people, when they give the name of cause to the latter, are groping in the dark, as it were, and are giving it a name that does not belong to it. And so one man makes the earth stay below the heavens by putting a vortex about it. And another regards the earth as a flat trough supported on a foundation of air. But they do not look for the power which causes things to be now placed as it is best for them to be placed. Nor do they think it has any divine force, but they think they can find a new atlas, more powerful and more immortal and more all-embracing than this. And in truth, they give no thought to the good, which must embrace and hold together all things. Now, I would gladly be the pupil of anyone who would teach me the nature of such a cause. But since that was denied me, and I was not able to discover it myself, or to learn of it from anyone else, do you wish me, Cedis, to give you an account of the way in which I have conducted my second voyage in quest of the cause? Thank you. Plato's failure. Right. Socrates' failure. Agree? Mm -hmm. He fell. He couldn't find anybody. Uh, at 95 C? Yes, please. Where, where uh, it says, uh, at the beginning of that uh, 95? Did you say 95? Yes. He said 95 C. Sorry, Juan. What was the point? Uh, I'm, I'm looking for it. Anyway, um, it says, and I again tried to find out how these things perish, and I investigated the phenomena of heaven and earth. 95 C. Yeah. Um, no, 96 C. 96 C. I made my mind, and I finally made up my mind that I was by nature totally unfitted for this kind of investigation. Those three more words that the guy left out as being totally useless. He <laughs> left that out. As being totally useless. Totally useless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then I guess all of you would agree this is Socrates' failure as reported by Plato. Of course, if he found a teacher, would have you know he would have taken three units and would have gotten the answer. <laughs> no, you agree? I mean, it's his failure. Come on, he flopped. In Greek, it's called Socrates' flop, but they they changed. We're we're agreeing this is a flop because of what exactly? Well, you'd agree he did want to discover something. He tells us what he wanted to discover. He never found anyone who could teach him. And therefore, he had to give it up. And now he's going to tell us his second voyage, since he couldn't uh, get the answer to that most enjoyable question. Hmm. No, I don't think he gave up the question. I didn't say he gave up the question in that sense. He may have given up the quest for understanding. But he did, yes, in one way, he did give up the quest for understanding in those terms, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's a flaw. No. No. A well, do you think it could be, it might be a flaw because he already had an answer? Would you agree, in terms of this work, that he did want to find the answer? Now, I would gladly be the pupil of anyone who would teach me the nature of such a cause. But since that was denied me, and I was not able to discover it myself, or to learn of it from anyone else, do you wish me, uh, CBs, to give you an account of the way in which I have conducted my second voyage in quest of the cause? Of course. So is that... He never, that learned, he never learned, did he? That's else. Else. He didn't find the teacher. I, my, my question was, is that is that because he already had an answer? And you're saying he didn't find anyone to teach. You're probably him. right. Let's get the question and see whether or not he answered it. What's the question? Come on, what's the question he wanted to get? What did he want to know? A few uh <clears throat>
See, they, they fail. They fail in the quest of causes. Whoever talks in that way is unable to make a distinction and to see that in reality it causes one thing. Ah, and the thing without which the cause could never be a cause is quite another thing. Then he pushes it, does he not? At the bottom of the page with that atlas reference. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, but they do not look for the power which causes things to be now placed as it is best for them to be placed nor do they think it has any divine force, but they think they can find a new atlas more powerful and more immortal and more all-embracing than this. And in truth, they give no thought to the good, which must embrace and hold together all things. What is it? In truth, they give no thought to the good, which must embrace and hold together all things. Now, I would gladly be a pupil of anyone who would teach me the nature of this, right, of such a part. What is it that he failed to get them, just so we can say it? You mean he hasn't been taught the nature of the good as common? I don't know, I just, uh, however you... You asked me to state it, right? That, that was my core. I was going to write it on the board. Oh, okay. Well, it seems to... Wait a minute, wait a minute, just to make it impressive. I'll use the word. Oh, okay. that's okay, right. Okay, why? <laughs> then I understood it to be they think they can find a new act that's more powerful and more and more, more all embracing than this and the truth they and in truth they give no thought to the good which much in great must be okay. to the good and how does it describe to the good which must embrace and hold together all things embrace and hold together all things and it seems like you're right, because he says that I would gladly be the pupil of anyone who could teach me the nature of such a cause. So he wants to know the nature of the good that embraces and holds together all. Right, oh. And he never found a teacher and never learned it, so. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, I don't know. I just want to know how the rest of it is concluded. I thought it would Oh, I thought you meant, okay. I, I was not able to discover it myself or to learn of it from anyone else. Hmm. Yeah, so you're holding out that maybe he sneaked away at discovering it by himself and therefore did have the answer? If so, I'm not so. sure. Either that or that there isn't a nature to that which he's asking and therefore he can't come to it. Is it a failure then at this point? I don't know if it's Plato style. Well, did he look for someone who could teach him? No. Did he it's find anybody? No. no. Therefore? But did he not discover it himself? Oh, you're holding out. He Therefore, he's kind, he of, he's kind of sneaky, and he really <laughs> did discover it himself, and will hope to find that. Therefore, won't be his failure. But he's being a little um, curious and holding out at this point. Yes. By the way, but see, my translation is better than yours because I spend much more money than you guys have. Don't agree with mine. You have a hard time. I see that. <laughs> Paperback. Paperback. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> now I would gladly be the pupil of anyone who could teach me the nature of such a cause. But since that was denied me, I was not able to discover it for a long while until finally, through my own efforts, I was able to glean the secret of this great mystery, and I have brought it together in a fine and splendid manner, so that I now can say that searching for such a cause has given me the benefit of such grand visions, and has brought me to the point where I now can appreciate the wisdom of such a cause. That's what it said. Well, maybe I read it between the lines a little bit. No, he didn't. You didn't say that? No. Well, what does he say? I was not able to discover it myself or to learn it of it from anyone else. And my colleague, right, who to your left said, I'll tell you the answer to that. He did find it himself. He didn't want to mention it. No, he said that. He, did, he, he knows the secret teacher. He's got the secret teacher. Or we'll find it later. <laughs> or we'll find right, wait a minute, right? That's what that's right. What do you think? Yeah. Well, look here, we'll do it right. Let's vote. 
then we can settle it. We vote. Uh -huh. not agree. And when people vote, they always vote in the right way, don't they? Throughout <laughs> history, no vote was ever taken. Right? And everybody knows the general and the common good, right? <laughs> well, he's in a dilemma. I mean, he tried it himself. He couldn't discover it himself. He couldn't find anyone else. Would you go further and say the second voyage doesn't even close come to the understanding of this? Oh, yeah. Yes, I know. Want to take a look? Yeah. Let's take a look. I mean, the second voyage, not very distinguished, but I'll give it my view. Let's go so, watching. Does the second voyage he's talking about answer this? Yes or no? It doesn't. Second voyage. Unless you want to think he's a, you know, a smart guy. And that's not true. Agreed. Right. See, and I got him on my side, so that's two of us against all the rest of them. Mark, what do you think? Three of us. Right? Three of us are four in the committee. In defense of Socrates' failure. <laughs> Nancy, what can be? Remember now, breakfast is at stake now. You have no breakfast to give you some very good. Uh, is it a failure so far? So far. All right. Shall we now see? I gave this up. And I'll tell you about my second voyage. Let's take a look at the second voyage. Wait a minute. Does he get home or is he adrift? To keep the energy of the voyage. Does he get home with it? Or does he land somewhere else and not here at all? Okay, let's go. Flat failure. Good. Good. Success. Okay. I mean, what do you expect with a paperback? Anyhow, it's Greek. You know what they say, never look at Greek parts in the mouth and they have holes too. And whatever you do, never run them any That's not the way it goes. Go further, two pages? Absolutely. Okay. After this then, since I had given up investigating realities, I decided that I must be careful not to suffer the misfortune, which happens to people who look at the sun and watch it during the eclipse. Or some of them ruin their eyes unless they look at its image of water or something of the sort. I thought of that danger and I was afraid my soul would be blinded if I looked at things with my eyes and tried to grasp them in any of my senses. So I thought I must have recourse to conceptions and examine in them the truth of realities. Yeah. Now, Let me do that again. Yeah. Go ahead. Now perhaps my metaphor is not quite accurate, for I do not grant in the least that he who studies realities by means of conceptions is looking at them in images any more than he who studies them in the facts of daily life. However, that is the way I began. I assume in each case some principle which I consider strongest, and whatever seems to me to agree with this, whether relating to cause or to anything else, I regard as true. Whatever seems to me to agree with this, I regard as true. And whatever disagrees with it, as untrue. But I want to tell you more clearly what I mean, for I think you do not understand now. Not very well, certainly, as it seems. Well, this is what I mean. It is nothing new, but the same thing that I've always been saying, both in our previous conversation and elsewhere. I'm going to try to explain to you the nature of that cause which I have been studying. And I will revert to those familiar subjects of ours as my point of departure, and assume that there are such things as absolute beauty, and good, and greatness, and the like. If you grant this, and agree that these exist, I believe I shall explain the cause to you, and shall prove that the soul is immortal. Yes, mm -hmm. going to assume mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry. You may assume, said Cedis, that I grant it, and go on. Then, 
see if you agree with me in the next step. I think that if anything is beautiful besides absolute beauty, I think that if anything is beautiful besides absolute beauty, it is beautiful for no other reason than because it partakes of absolute beauty. And this applies to everything. Do you assent to this view of cause? I do. I do not yet understand, nor can I perceive those other ingenious causes. If anyone tells me that what makes a thing beautiful is its lovely color, or its shape, or anything else of the sort, I let all that go. For all those things confuse me, and I hold simply and plainly, and perhaps foolishly, to this that nothing else makes it beautiful but the presence or communion, call it what you please, of the absolute beauty, however it may have been made. About the way in which it happens, I make no positive statement as yet, but I do insist that beautiful things are made beautiful by beauty. For I think this is the safest answer I can give to myself or to others. And if I cling fast to this, I think I shall never be overthrown. And I believe it is safe for me or anyone else to give this answer, that beautiful things are beautiful through you. Do you agree? Hey, it goes on like this. Let's turn to the idea of participation. Would you, now come on, you got to pull it together. It's a failure. That what we're posi that's our position. The dialogue is a flop failure. Socrates fails, doesn't he? Yes. Right? All right. This is called the second voyage. Does the second voyage overcome the failure? If it does, you can use that idea to answer this question. It goes one way or the other, doesn't it? Or to put it simply, does the doctrine of participation overcome and therefore bring it to the point where you can see that this is true, does it? That's all. Now, if you guys want to say Plato, that's your business, but so far it's a flop, isn't it? Why? I have to, I have to repeat myself? You tell me. No, why is it a flop? The second well, is, it, is it a failure or not? Does the doctrine of participation bring him to the truth of this? That's all. Very simple. No rhetoric. Answer, please. Why would we reject it? I mean, isn't the position that we're looking at that would you agree that we are justified in holding to the notion that Socrates has failed in his attempt, yes or no, to find a cause that would satisfy this idea? Yes or no? In the first one or the second? First. Yes. Thank you. It's a failure. Are we now trying to find a way to see whether that his failure continues? Yes. Good. We have now his answer, the idea of participation. Yes. Things are beautiful because there is such a thing as participating in beauty. I love that argument. By the way, does that answer this? Well, he does mention absolute beauty and good and uh -huh. greatness. I don't mind that. Does it answer this? Remember what this is. What's the position he has to show? That there is a cause that is the good that embraces and holds together all things. Thank you. Did that answer it? No. Come on, you can, you can be straightforward. No. You don't have to save the dude. He's dead. I don't owe him any money, so I, <laughs> right? So I have to say the truth. So he if I owed him something, then I might have to, you know, go, be cautious. But. He doesn't mention embracing and holding together. All Thank this. you. Conclusion. <laughs> 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 failure, right? Come on, yes or no? If it weren't a failure, he'd have to mention that at those elements. Is that what you're saying? You're a few players. Forget what I think. I don't think it. There it is. Look, I'll get someone fair on your side. Todd, what do you think? So far, it's a failure. It's a failure. So far. No. And does the doctrine of participation save that failure, turn it into a success? No. More failing. There, I'll see. <laughs> now, come on, find a counter argument, use the text. Come on, what do they do? But he does say things will never fail. 
Pardon? Uh, it, it says in the same paragraph in this translation that he's found the safe answer to give to himself or anyone else, including to this, I think I shall never fail. No, but he's not failing with something. Can you put it? Yeah, he has to go. Unless these absolute ideas are exactly what can account and the doctrine of participation for the embracing and the holding together. I'll tell you what. We need someone. Hey, Todd, you're doing well. Why don't you hold this position for a moment? Could you restate it? What is it that Socrates found he could not find a teacher for, or discover any teacher, but he wanted to know it? The good teacher was good that holds all things together. Embraces and holds all things together, right? He wanted to know that. Right. He couldn't find a teacher. Or Failure. Correct. Now he says, I tell you what, I went on a second voyage to try to find a way around this. Was it successful? Therefore? It's failure. Now, now argue with him. I'll listen. I'm just saying. Maybe we haven't read far. Okay, all right. <laughs> what the heck? Good thing we'll read more. And wait a minute. If we read more, will you point out when we might get an answer to this riddle? Because we don't want to just read and stumble over it. You'll holler if we bump into it, even by accident. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Okay. Me too. You too. All right. <laughs> but so far, how does it look? I like it so far. I think it looks beautiful. I do that. <laughs> We're not here to admire it. Yeah, I'm making a I don't want to admire it. You want to see what it makes any. Hey, is it, is it a rational? Is it, come on, is it rational? It's beautiful too. <clears throat> yeah. You sound convincing, therefore I love it. Uh. Well, and. <laughs> It, it also is just what appears to him, right? Whatever statement seems to him to be good. I'm supporting you, right? Just based upon appearance. Let, let me check. What is he saying? I didn't know either, but I was hoping that you would know what he was saying. <laughs> and then I wouldn't say it. He's not helping. Me. Well, I was just making the point that he, uh, he indicates that as part of his second voyage, he just assumes yes. whatever principle yes. he even says it. He thinks the strongest. Right. And whatever seems to him to agree with this. So it's just a, a procedure based upon appearance. Well, an assumption. On assumption, not appearance. Yes. Or assumption and appearance. Okay. Whatever seems And therefore you'd be willing to fault agree. that as well, would you not? Agree. You'd be willing to fault the argument with that, would you not? Uh, yes. Thank you. My colleague is saying, not only is it a lousy argument, but he has to assume things, and therefore he's using an argument where there isn't even any possibility of touching reality and basing his arguments on kind of reality. They're all assumptions. You got the point you make? Right. Sure, he's pointing out the weakness, isn't he? Good. <laughs> Double failure. <laughs> Wait a minute, I'll change it, right? Double. Double failure. Okay, let's go. You did say you'd read a few more pages. Is sure. Up to it? Thanks. Absolutely. Don't worry. Okay. And great things are great. Uh, page? Uh, page 345 in the lobe, and it's uh, 100E. Okay. It's going to use one word, -E a brighter suffix. Ness, N-E-S-S, -S, right? Ness, 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 Ness. Right? Okay. 
whatever word he puts in here, I watch the nurse. And ER. Watch the two, the way he plays with them. Okay, good. And great things are great, and greater things greater by greatness. And smaller things smaller by Anything smallness. with an ER can be attributed to an S. Any ER can be attributed to something that possesses that quality called an S. So, right, and you would not accept the statement if you were told that one man was greater or smaller than another by a head, but you would insist that you say only that every greater thing is greater than another by nothing else than greatness, and that it is greater by reason of greatness. And that which is smaller is smaller by nothing else than smallness, and is smaller by reason of smallness. For you would, I think, be afraid of meeting with the retort if you said that a man was greater or smaller than another by a head. First, that the greater is greater and the smaller is smaller by the same thing. And secondly, that the greater man is greater by a head, which is small, and that it is a monstrous thing that one is great by something that is small. Would you not be afraid of this? Yes. Then you would be afraid to say that 10 is more than 8 by 2, and that this is the reason it is more. You would say it is more by number and by reason of number. And a 2 cubit measure is greater than a 1 cubit measure, not by half, but by magnitude, would you not? For you would have the same fear. Certainly. Well then, if one is added to one or if one is divided, you would avoid saying that the addition of the division is the cause of the two. You would exclaim loudly that you know no other way by which anything can come into existence than by participating in the proper essence of each thing in which it participates. And therefore you accept no other cause of the existence of two than participation in duality. And things which are to be two must participate in duality. And whatever is to be one must participate in unity. And you would pay no attention to the divisions and additions and other such subtleties, leaving those for wiser men to explain. You would distrust your inexperience and would be afraid, as the saying goes, of your own shadow. So you would cling to that safe principle of ours and would reply, as I have said. And if anyone attacked the principle, you would pay him no attention, and you would not reply to him until you had examined the consequences to see whether they agreed with one another or not. And when you had to give an explanation of the principle, you would give it in the same way, by assuming some other principle which seemed to you the best of the higher ones, and so on, until you reached one which was absent. You would not mix things up, as disputants do, in talking about the beginning and its consequences, if you wish to discover any of the realities, but perhaps not one of them thinks or cares in the least about these things. They are so clever that they succeed in being well pleased with themselves, even when they mix everything up. But if you are a philosopher, I think you will do as I have said. Um, would you agree, sir, with what you said? Hmm. Would I agree with what he said? Yeah. Like CV says? And and so does it, but here's the point, isn't it? The whole point is here. Isn't it? Like you're saying, you know, no other way by which anything can come into existence than by participating in the proper essence of each thing. Right. Doctrine of participation. Look here, whether you accept it or not doesn't matter. What does count, does this answer the very point that we're raising. I don't see how it does. And if it doesn't, it's a flop. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 let me check. Yeah. Louder? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> no. It's a flop. Do you agree with the flop? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. And it ends at this point. Agree? It's a plateau. Have we reached a plateau? Yes or no? Then Equities and Phaedo come back in, do they not? I 
And from now on, they're just going to use two, two ideas. And here they are. Anything that admits of degrees, greater or lesser, in any sphere presupposes there must be something in which it thinks it's greater or lesser, or ER, and that must be some ness, goodness, or anything else you want to call it. And if you want to say that, then everything that's in ER gains its ER net, its ER quality, from this kind of a statement, yes or no? So what? Does that go back and answer this, sir? Give us your frank opinion. No. Good. It's a failure? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Time for a break. I need to call the coffee. You don't need any? Yeah. <laughs> well, Alex, it's mine. Look, you're a green right You're a green right on. Yeah, good. 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 like a barn or anything else, you have to have materials. That's your cause, isn't it? You have to have mm -hmm. materials. Materials by themselves are not going to create the barn. You need workmen, an efficient cause. That's what it's called. Right? But just because you have workmen and the material, it's not going to get you the barn. They have to follow a plan, a design. Formal cause. He said, you know what? Just because you have a plan, workers, and material, it's not going to get you the barn. Unless someone needs it. It has to be the sake for something. That for the sake of which you came into existence. Someone has to want it. Finally. But, so Socrates is looking at this and he's saying, hey, you know, this search for causes, this search for causes misses something. What is it that it misses? He said, you know what? One word he uses. How do you know that if you, of course, this is uh, the mind of nature I mentioned earlier. Um, interesting guy from the did a work that's published in Oxford University Press. He said, you know, we have to give up causes. He said, you got to give up causes. You just have to put your mind on one thing, and that is, that everything is interrelated. Forget about particular causes. It's all interrelated. Cause <coughs> dependence. Very interesting notion. So 
That means the best, one of the best theoretical scientists now is coming and leaving materialism is now into realism. Right? Big step. Socrates is saying, I got news for you. It's not understanding unless you can show that the way things are are the way they are because it's best for them to be in that way. And unless you know that the very order in which they can be said to be interrelated is best, you haven't really reached the significance of understanding causes. Is this what you have to find out? You don't find out it's just secondary. So it's not enough to see everything is interrelated. You have to demonstrate to Socrates that the particular arrangement has its best for it to be that way, and any other way in which it could be would be inferior, and therefore it has to be the best of all possible worlds. Uh, so what would be that with relationship to the, the analogy of the, uh, the barn and the worker and the plan and the one? How would that be in the barn? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it would be saying that all of these things are very nice, <coughs> but you have to see how all the parts, all of the parts interrelate into a unity. Now, some people would say that's what you have when you have the design of the plan. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's as far as Martin can go. You see, you can't go to the next step. You can't say the universe is, is made in such a way so that it is that for the sake of which it came into being. You can't say, therefore, that the particular design and order which everything is fits it into such exquisite ways, that there's any purpose behind it. <laughs> there is no Now, let's go back, all right? What does Socrates say about this thinking? Remember, it's really, essentially, it's an anti-exactly system. Right, got a good quote? We need it. Whoa. Okay. What does he find deficient? How, what does he like, or what is it? Yeah, how mind is really the arranger and cause of all things. Well, if you say there's mind arranging all things, that's not enough. You have to show that the way in which an arrangement is made is such that it's the best of all possible ways for it to be arranged. Therefore, it presents the highest meaning in the arrangement which it has. Next up, best. Got a quote? Let's go. Come on. <coughs> what page you on? Um, it's, I have a different version of it. Okay. 339? Mr. Thomas. Uh, 98C. 92 is good. Yeah, 90, yeah, it's like 97C probably. Okay. Well, there's a deficiency in 98C. Perhaps that's not quite good. Wait, are we looking for a deficiency? I thought the question was, what did Socrates find to be deficient with the anaxagoras' uh, 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 approach? But the section on anaxagoras starts at 97. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the deficiency is 98. Feet. But they do not look for the power which causes things to be now placed as it is best for them to be placed. <clears throat> right, they do not look for the power which presents things to be in such a place that is best for them to be placed such as they are. All right, that, how important is this? Major. Repeats it several times, as you know. Um, <clears throat> Well, they started out with 
as I went on with my reading, I saw that the man made no use of intelligence and did not assign any real causes for the ordering of things, but mentioned his causes there. Could you get everyone with you? Yes, 98C. 98. Good, please. Go ahead. Um, 98D or C. 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 Go ahead. As I went on with my reading, I saw that the man made no use of intelligence and did not assign any real causes for the order ordering of things, but mentioned as causes air and ether and water and many other absurdities. And it seemed to me it was very much as if one should say that Socrates does, does with intelligence whatever he does. And then in trying to give the causes of the particular thing I do, should say first that I am not sitting here because my body is composed of bones and sinews and the bones are hard and have joints which divide them and the sinews can be contracted and relaxed with the flesh and the skin which contains them all are laid about the bones. I don't know. The conclusion he comes yeah. to. Uh, that the cause of his being in jail at that moment cannot be found in these. Hmm. Right. But I'm here because I think it's best for me to be here. And right. the Athenians thought it was best for Back me to be the same here. word, isn't it? Right. So we need more. Huh. You have to unpack what he means by best. And cause. Yes, yes. <coughs> Dostoevsky has this. <clears throat> right, Dostoevsky has this. He does it well. And the idiot, or the possessed, depending upon which trans translation it is. Um, the argument is to show the justice in the universe. And the argument is you have to show that a single tear of a child was necessary. Mm -hmm. And not casual but must be linked together in a meaningful way to show the intimate and the complete justice of the universe. Not even one child, just two, is justified. Because right. everybody's willing to say, well, okay, you have to go for the greater good. Sacrifice whatever it is you're doing, right? All for the greater good, Dostoevsky is saying, alone. You don't even want to give up even one single tear from an innocent child to justify what it is you call good. That's best. It has to be best for all things. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be exactly where it is. Best. You say, boy, you know what? I've been looking for a guy who would teach that. No, 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 no. Failure. <laughs> ah, failure. Which is what you'd expect with something that's old. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> Very powerful statement. One thing, tear. And he can't find a teacher. They never did. Never found it. He's glad to be a teacher if someone could teach him that kind of cause, which would demonstrate that everything is the way it is because it's best for it to be that way and no other way. Wow. Hey, even if he could, if he could, would that answer this? Huh. If so, he gave up. Gave up. Well, what did he need a teacher for? He already knew it. He found himself. 
<clears throat> he was the teacher. He didn't need a teacher. But he, he didn't need a teacher because he never learned anything. He didn't need <laughs> to learn anything because he already heard it. There are good teachers and second-rate teachers. This is a second-rate teacher. He admits he flopped. What, do you want to save him because he wore a beard? Of course. Good. <laughs> <laughs> So, come on, keep, keep reading. Well, um... I like that. I, I do that myself. I, well, uh, 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 why do you want to call him a flop? I think that's what we should focus on. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Because I... <laughs> did, did he admit that he didn't gain what he wanted to gain? Yeah. Well, he had to have known that already to say that he didn't gain it. He had to know it already. Then why, pardon me, what? He, he already knew. That he was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> he already realized how That he was a failure. He, I think he's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a Let's change the negative. He's a liar. <laughs> Just as that one section. Did well, he, why did he need a second voyage? That's all. The first one failed. Mm -hmm. Agree? Mm -hmm. No. Why not? Well, because um, I'm not clear the first or second voyage. Hey, I'm easy to persuade. Voyager. Just give me a good quote. Mm -hmm. Did someone direct her? She has the routers. Um, yeah. mm. <coughs> okay. Can I see what else? Okay. What are you looking for? <coughs> Julie, right at the end of the first voyage. I don't know. Yeah, the end of the first voyage. 5.03. Mm. Oh, okay. Mm. <coughs> Well, if you want to add something more to the dialogue, um, <clears throat> in the first part of the dialogue, would you agree he has the idea of the separation of the soul from the body, and he has a yoga? Yes. Did we not discuss that? He has a yoga for the separation of the soul from the body, so that it then gains an insight into the nature of the divine? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. yes. Let's assume that. Does that answer it? Since it doesn't, then here's a question, even though he's had this great mystical experience, it's inadequate to solve the problems that we face. That's all, you know, just face up to it. <laughs> Unless we're misreading it, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> That's right. As you look at the description he has of the separation of soul from the body, we do not agree you can find several quotes where he talks about what kind of experience that is. Would you agree you can go there and look at it? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. Good. If we had it, then could we use that to answer this question and say, by heavens, he forgot that he talked about that previously during the separation of soul from the body. He gained an insight into this and therefore he knew it immediately and therefore the whole idea of his failure is just a platonic joke. Okay. Socratic iron. Socratic iron. Oh, oh no, I would rather say, okay, if you want my personal opinion, he was forgetful. He forgot that he covered it earlier. How's that? Possible. Possible? Appropriate? Okay, just no, no. Hold out, no. No. Oh. Because he doesn't. Just because you experience, even if you have a direct experience with the good, it doesn't say that. He doesn't demonstrate he, that. He doesn't link it to this. Right. So it's either possible to link it and he doesn't say it, or it's separate and distinct from this, and just because he had that mystical experience of separation of self and the body, it doesn't answer this question. And therefore, I guess the easiest answer to that is that mystical experiences sometimes are useful, fun, profound, but they ain't of the kind that will solve this kind of a problem. Therefore, it's a fictitious problem.
Well, don't we have to consider that the, that he's going into this particular argument because of uh, Simeus? And although Simeus was present for the earlier argument mm -hmm. of the separation and the practice of the separation of soul from body, from body there's no evidence that Simeus got it. That's true. And therefore, <clears throat> when Simeus presents this example based upon his local myth that he believes, Socrates advances this. The problem, if you, ask, if you were to ask me my opinion, I, I'd say that the problem that I see is that um, he does say that things come into being from ideas, by participation in ideas, right? Mm -hmm. But he also says, does he not? And I was looking for the place at different points in the discussion that he doesn't he, he doesn't know the nature of participation. So even if he wants to assume certain things about the nature of participation, yeah. he doesn't show them. But that's only isn't that is that not only? Uh, I guess I wanted to say, aren't aren't we trying here to deal with Simeus's belief and not? And therefore, he's recounting his early history with this? Well, I think you're right, because in my translation, well, yeah. this whole section isn't even in there. Why is that? Well, because the person who put it together realized it must have been added by some drunk Greek. Mm -hmm. Or, <coughs> say, look, we can go to the section where the even is describing the state of mind he's in when the separation of soul from the body, right? And you can take a look at it and see whether that would qualify as a basis for answering the question. It Either doesn't. Either it does or it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. He doesn't mention the good in there. But, need a good quote? Yeah. Okay. okay. I have one. Where but is when it? When she examines by where herself. Is it? Wait, where is it? Stephanus. Oh. Um, I'm in the Rouse uh, 484. It's the Faunus um, 79D. 79D. But when she examines by herself, she goes away yonder to the pure ever and everlasting and immortal and unchanging. And being akin to that, she abides ever with it whenever it becomes possible for her to abide by herself. And there she rests from her wanderings. And while she is amongst those things, she is herself unchanging, because what she takes hold of is unchanging. And this state of the soul has the name of wisdom. I like the quote. And I was, and I was saying that the good, right? Wisdom is in here, obviously, but it just doesn't mention the good in this quote. That's the only point I was making. Thank you. Does it answer the issue? Can we use that quote to say, ah, certainly it covers it? Well, after I read it, it I think it depends on uh, if you can um, link wisdom with the good. Mm -hmm. Well, on the next page, there's a plus. There's a next, another paragraph that says, but the soul, the unseen part of us, which goes to another place, noble and pure, and unseen like itself, a true unseen Hades, to the presence of the good and wise God, where, if God will, my own soul must go very soon. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Does that answer that question? No. no can, you use that, can you use that quote mm -hmm. and no. say, yes, it certainly can answer that. No, it can. We can no, okay, thanks for the quote, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Julie, too. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, okay, well, close up shop after all. We worked long enough. <laughs> yeah. Might have to read the rest of it when we come back, huh? Mm -hmm. If we want to save Plato. Hmm? If we want to save Plato, or see if he saves himself. Well, I don't have to because there's my position up there. It's a failure. Kimar, don't you have a position about how an answer to this? Pardon me. I don't recall it. If I do. I was just asking him if he has an answer to this 
question, Marone. Go ahead. Because, well, I mentioned that, uh, right, he does, he, he does, um, in the example of participation, right, he has the idea of beauty itself and then all things participate in that one idea. Yeah. Therefore, that, in that example, that is a, uh, there's nothing outside of that. So there is an embracing and there is a holding together of all things. How did you put that last part together? <laughs> well, did he just slip that in? He did. Kind of just slip that well, under cover. If you, if you have beauty itself and all beautiful things participate of that one beautiful thing, Thank you. therefore nothing is excluded from it. I mean, except things that are not beautiful. Right, I, I mean, in terms of things that are just beautiful. I'm, I'm getting here. In terms of things that are beautiful, right, they, they're all embraced or participate and are held together in some sort of way because they're all beautiful. I agree with you. Watch. And this is where it went to Imar, and Imar pointed out that in, uh, right before this same quote, he assumes um, also the good, right? Uh, no, I mean, what does he assume? Well, his assumption is about, um, where's the quote, Mark? do you have it? Uh, let's see. No, remember now, you have to link those two pieces together. Right. Yeah, right. <clears throat> it's, um, assumes that there are such things as absolute beauty and good? Yeah, that's right, yes. what page is that? 345 in the low. Okay. So, or um, 100 uh, B. Okay. So, um, I don't know. Uh, a new colleague, Rich, say hello. Hi, Chris. Hello. Um, something just came up for me, and that is there's an underlying assumption in all of this, and that is that you can arrive at a satisfying answer to that yeah. through philosophical, logical discourse. Hmm. Well, or you should be able to present the solution of that in that way in which you just described. Yeah. You might get that far sure. away. May not. You might not even get that far Because, this is where you have to go, because. Get help, get help. You need a because. Okay, thanks. See you next time. All right, I'm about to. Or you may. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Next time is Meaning the that retreat, you though, right? Oh, so the retreat. We have we a couple of back. remarks to make for the retreat. Well, people who signed up for it should pay for it. That would be good. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Don't forget and, that one. And